Allah. Um, the we, we we see a Will it be, sir, sir, name, sir, a small request, sir, uh, sir, uh, only if you please uh, minimize this uh, now. Yeah. At the inaugural session, we have to, yes, sir, okay. Thank you, sir.
ചിത്ര ഇപ്പൊ നൗ യു ക്യാൻ ഷെയർ ദാറ്റ് എന്നിട്ട് തുടങ്ങുമ്പോഴത്തേക്കും വി വിൽ is it visible it is visible yeah okay okay i need to give permission to people who are uh, okay okay yeah we just we okay, yeah so when we see yeah that is a problem i think for vc it is not problem because in ku even for that you have to give permission yeah so now since Ma- we are all are sitting in uh, a different area and yeah. all together yes. it's a really very really hectic because i need to admit people outside the universities okay, okay. Uh, so if i put this the only, uh, sometimes i might miss somebody to put okay okay, okay 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 it is a problem so okay, then okay shall i send it to someone of you ss yes, yes. send it to uh, logesh is there no lokesh send it to me has, lokesh has it already okay so yes. can he do this i don't know also oh, you send it to me okay 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 Dr. Balu. Very nice to see you here, sir. Yes, yes, please. So it is good to see you all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, privileged to see you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, we, we see, sir, all have joined. So shall we start even speak? Uh, sir, is there? Shall yeah, we start? Yeah. I think we can start by exactly four. Okay. Four. Okay. Two more minutes are there. Okay. Yeah, sir. that will be fine. Yeah. Thank you. ോ <laughs> infected in groups okay, uh, that is why we had the no, severe uh, okay sir so you are getting already getting the monsoon rains yes sir already and, uh, last uh, couple of days even now it is raining here sir in trichur oh okay okay nice 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 we did the tree planting uh, in the rain oh okay 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 okay, okay. <laughs> everybody, you know. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Rama Sami, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Um, um, Rama. Yes, yes. So yes. Yes, 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 yes. You are not a student. Yeah. Okay, sir. <laughs> We also met in, I think, Raipur again. Uh, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Raipur, I was there. Sandra Sagaran, good afternoon. Uh, sir, uh, sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, good afternoon. KLU White Chancellor was uh, asking you, you know, just to respond to them. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, how are you, sir? I am fine, uh, Professor Chandra Sagaran. How are you? 
Ah, nice sir. Doing, doing, doing very well. Doing very well. Yeah, nice to see you after uh, from the Long planning time. division. Yes, yes. <laughs> Director planning and monitoring. Yes, yes. 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 Nice to see Dr. you. Dr. Prema, can we start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, okay. with all your permission, uh, so let us uh, start today's uh, program being organized by the Department of Agricultural Economics, uh, College of Agriculture, Vallanikara. So, I, first of all, I am welcoming all of you. And now I call upon our assistant professor, Dr. Hema, to give a very brief introduction. Hema. Good evening to all. The Department of Agriculture Economics, since inspection, has been engaged in applied policy and problem solving research in agriculture, rural, and allied sectors. The studies include PG and PhD, and also the faculty research project in various fields such as crop husbandry, integrated farming system, irrigation, agriculture credit, natural resource management, rural energy, gender, trade, and development issues. The department undertakes consultation project in farm planning, project appraisal, price forecasting, and also organizes training program at the regional, state, and national level. Through the Center of Excellence in Environment Economics attached to the department, we have re generated research evidence which serve as a vital inputs for policy formulation for sustainable development. The various capacity building programs um, to the selected representatives to the, of local site bodies are also being organized. The department also hosts the Padma Sri Paul Potter IFPO Chair of Kerala Agriculture University. Today we are initiating a lecture series on agriculture development and economic transformation. Now I invite Dr. Anita Cherian, Dean, College of Agriculture, Velanikera, for the welcome address. Economics and Department of Agriculture, Economics, College of Agriculture, Velanikera. And uh, during this occasion, I'm very happy that our Honorable Vice Chancellor is with us. And uh, it is indeed my privilege to welcome you, sir, to this program. And today, being the World um, Environment Day, Honorable Vice Chancellor is indeed preoccupied with many programs. And at College of Agriculture itself, here, this is the second one. So despite his very busy schedule, our um, Honorable Vice Chancellor has kindly consented to give the inaugural address during this webinar. And uh, he is, sir, is always, has always been a constant source of support and inspiration in all the activities or endeavors of this university. Thank you, sir. And I welcome you, sir. And on the behalf of uh, all the organizers, staff, and students, I once again wholeheartedly welcome you, sir, to this lecture series. And thank you for your consent to deliver the inaugural address. And uh, I also welcome other dignitaries on uh, this virtual platform, former vice chancellors, professors. And now I formally welcome our guest of honor and the speaker of the day, Dr. Balasubramanian R, the professor of agriculture economics, TNAU, who will be enlightening us um, on the issues of how to bring about a balance between economic growth and environment. And uh, uh, I think uh, now I will in invite Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Chandra Babu, sir, to deliver the inaugural address. Good evening, uh, colleagues. At the outset, I am uh, very happy to see my Vice Chancellor, Professor Ramasamy. He was a two term. Vice Chancellor of TNAU, and his leadership is uh, such a one that uh, we used to call him as CEO of uh, TNAU, not the Vice Chancellor of TNAU. That is the thing he did, and he identified the young talents in the university and uh, gave them responsibilities. He delegated the responsibilities to the youngster, and he always moved with the youngsters. So that kind of a spirit and energy we could always imbibe from our former vice chancellor. And such an opportunity that he gave me during his term as vice chancellor, he actually given an opportunity to serve the great institution as a dean, School of Postgraduate Studies. 
sir i am really that is a, i will say a change point in my uh, career but for your uh, vision and also what you identified what potential you have saw in me and uh, made you to give that assignment i really don't know but uh, i i, I uh, whether i lived to your expectation still i don't know but that opportunity that platform actually turned my career into a newer uh, horizon into a newer uh, track and uh, today i am here means it is because you identified something in me and that made me here in uh, kerala agriculture university now i profusely thank your uh, vision and uh, identifying your uh, talents in youngsters and uh, encouraging youngsters to be as a team working for the benefit of the tamil nadu agriculture university i also want to thank to professor chandrasekharan for you know all of you you know that shows your interest in the subject and uh, what is happening in this uh, world in your particular uh, subject you are uh, even at this age you are actually joining in this program i really actually salute you for your attachment for this subject so chandrasekharan and myself are working very closely together even after my retirement both of us are working in uh, planning and monitoring and uh, professor balasubramanian is uh, it is called we call here him a couple of people like balasuri as n turks in tnu so they have eccentric views that's where i think diversified views actually clash and uh, a newer vision and newer knowledge and a newer direction uh, comes even today's title that shows the element of his uh, <laughs> what i why is it is a kind of a newer kind of a things it is like out of the box uh, title i would say thanks for uh, your valuable time and sharing your vision about this uh, growth and environment in our uh, country i really uh, very thank you sir so of course this inaugural address i don't know because in the midst of this well known uh, economist like you know uh, professor or former vice chancellor my inaugural address uh, regarding this subject economics growth and environment like uh, carrying a coal to a new castle so you are uh, the i think experts in that subject matter but uh, recently and uh, all over the world uh, three three objectives are there in front of us scientists farmers and stakeholders policy makers increasing product- productivity of the crop plants increasing the economic profitability to the farming community and sustainability of the environment so these three objectives is important for any ecosystem but whether all the three are whether mutually inclusive or whether they are mutually exclusive we really don't know we want to learn from uh, professor balu but what we have done or the uh, literature says something we have degraded the natural resources the ground water depletion the soil fertility or the soil health uh, what i think um, uh, the use of agricultural chemicals into the fields and the consequent effect on the environment and human health all this gives a gloomy picture whether our agriculture or crop husbandry is unscientific so far so we need to tread a new path so that we continuously increase crop productivity and crop production ensure continued in- increase in the income to the farming community at the same time conserve or sustain the natural resources my belief is that all the three are mutually inclusive if you consider the ecosystem services that we provide to the uh, the people as well as the uh, environment but uh, i think in our uh, this i have actually worked with the social scientists 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 especially agriculture economics starting with our former vice chancellor professor ramasamy sir many others like professor uh, selvaraj and uh, in abroad if you take uh, professor karl play in uh, rutgers state university like that in other extensions and terry tucker in cornell university so i have close uh, relation working together with uh, many of the soil scientists and everywhere it is called the department of food or uh, food department of uh, food agriculture agriculture food and natural resource economics so the natural resource economics always a part of your uh, studies so i would like to learn from you about uh, whether this agriculture growth or economical growth and environmental uh, you know the conservation of natural environment uh, sustainability can go in the hand so with these few words of introduction i am uh, happy to um, uh, request uh, uh, professor balasubramanian for his uh, sharing his experience with the audience
Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Vice okay. President, sir. Just one minute, sir. We need to have an introduction, sir. sir. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, we yeah. have. So, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Chitra Parain to introduce our chief uh, le le guest, Dr. Baras Brahmanyam, sir, to this audience. Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. Chandravabu, sir. Uh, uh, our former Vice Chancellor of TNAU, Dr. Uh, Ramsamy, sir. Uh, uh, my former HOD, Chandra Shekran, sir. And all, uh, Dr. Balu, sir, uh, I have immense pleasure to be with all of you on this platform today. Only thing is it is not offline. Uh, I respect the dean, faculty members from KAU and other SAUs and their students. With immense pleasure, I wish to introduce to you uh, Dr. Balasubramaniam, Professor of Agriculture Economics at TNU, and uh, most of his students know him as a wonderful researcher and a great um, teacher. He has been working um, in the area of natural resources and environmental economics for the past 13 years. Balusar, as we call him, he has handled uh, several research projects funded by international and national agencies such as ICR, State Planning Commission, about the Four Foundation, World Bank, South China Network for Development and Environmental Economics, Sandy, and the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN. He has been a postdoctoral visiting scholar at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, USA, during the period 2001 to 2002. He has also taught at Concord University, Seoul, South Korea for two years from 2009 to 11. He has published a number of research papers, book chapters and traveled across the world to present papers in national and international conferences. As a teacher, as we all know, some of us know here, his clarity of ideas in the subject and involvement in teaching have been of great help to many of his students, including me. He would take us to a different world with his theories in microeconomics and natural resource economics and also give us a clear idea about the applications to the real world situations. The ease with which he uh, would derive the complex equations I remember and give us their proof with simplicity have had tremendous impact on, uh, on his students, including me. Thank you, Bailu, sir, for accepting our invitation. And um, I'm immensely happy today to have all of you here. I request that all our young participants must take advantage of this golden opportunity and have fruitful discussions with all, all the August people, uh, persons who are present here. It is your uh, golden opportunity to have such great people on a single platform today here uh, to have fruitful discussions in the subject area. Now I invite Dr. Balu sir to begin the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chitra. Uh, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor of Kerala Agricultural University for uh, inviting me to deliver this talk. Uh, I am happy that our former Vice Chancellor, Professor Ram Samisar, is here. I thank Dr. Uh, you know, I mean, the Dean of College of Agriculture, Velanikar, also for uh, you know, uh, giving me the opportunity for uh, discussing some of the critical issues concerning environment and development in the present day context. And I also thank the faculty members of uh, the Department of Agricultural Economics at Kerala Agriculture University, the HOD, Dr. Chitra, and all those people. I'm also happy to uh, uh, welcome uh, uh, my colleagues from uh, as far as Delhi, Dr. Ramas Ramasundaram, uh, senior sci principal scientist at uh, ICIR and uh, Professor Rajeshwari Reina from Srinada University. So they are also joining me here for this lecture. So I welcome all of you, all my colleagues, Professor Palani Sami sir, Dr. Chandrasekhar sir, and all my former and current students who are joining here. So it is indeed a great pleasure to give a topic on such a vital a topic of such a vital importance to the present context. So actually, my topic was motivated by the fact that we in agricultural universities, the agricultural economics uh, students are relatively weaker in the subject of macroeconomics. That is an undeniable fact. So uh, another thing, so the, uh, side by side, they are also weaker in you know macro level perspectives on natural resource economics. We, we study a lot of theories in natural resource economics and environmental economics, but we lack uh, in-depth knowledge about the macro-level perspectives in, agri uh, in natural resource economics and environmental economics. So that is the main uh, you know, idea that motivated me to choose this particular topic. 
Now I will go into my presentation. So, yeah. Wait a minute. I'll go to the presentation. Yeah. If someone sees a glass like this, filled, uh, uh, half filled with water, a group of people will say that it is uh, half full, and another group will see that it is, uh, uh, you know, half empty. So that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, those who see the glass as half full are optimists, and those who see the glass as half uh, empty are pessimists. That is how we uh, describe the or uh, group the people into two categories. So like that, in uh, you know, environmental economics, there are uh, people, you know, who are uh, uh, arguing that the continued economic growth is possible with, uh, you know, in spite of environmental constraints. So these people are, you know, uh, techno optimists. And there is another group of people who argue that the continued economic growth uh, is not possible with the limited environmental resources and uh, resource constraints. So this is, the, uh, you know, uh, a very important topic in the sense that the debate is now very hot, especially in the context of uh, climate change and other critical issues facing uh, facing the environment and the development. So, with this uh, background, I have taken up this topic for today's talk. So, at the outset, I would like to go into the uh, capitalist revolution and the history, you know, which has made tremendous improvements in human li li livelihood and also various other uh, uh, you know, uh, measures of economic growth and uh, uh, you know, human uh, well-being. So, uh, the very, my, you know, if you look at the GDP, which is you know, looking like a hockey stick, so it, from the GDP is from uh, zero year of Christian era to until 2015 or so. So, we see the GDP is almost remaining static the line is uh, the, the line showing the GDP is overlaying the x-axis until at least 1870 or so. Only after 1870, with the advent of uh, industrial revolution, what? the Dali, GDP starts. Dali, you are moving the slide. Are you moving the slide? Yes, sir. But uh, we could uh, any others could uh, see the slides which uh, Professor Ball is uh, referring to. No, no, no. 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 It's not moving. So. Uh, the cursor of all on the cursor of particular slide of China, probably we can get it. If you have the cursor on the why don't you okay. point to the cursor, click the cursor on the particular slide? Wait a minute, sir. Okay, I will share it again. Is this visible, sir? This screen? Yeah, the first uh, screen of first, it starts in the first slide, your title slide. Okay, then this one, sir. Capitalist no. revolution and history is no. no, 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 we could not see that. Oh, I don't know what is the problem. No, 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 it has come. Now, now it has come, sir. Oh, I see. Sorry. Okay. I will go again. We are seeing the second slide. You are seeing the second slide? Yes. 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 No. yes, sir. yes. Sir, probably if you can go on slideshow mode, then the moment you yeah, move yeah. your cursor, yeah. you can move. Yeah, yeah. Slideshow mode. I am now in slideshow mode. But, but okay. yeah. yeah. Capitalism has, result, yes. I mean, has, uh, you know, uh, resulted in almost all around development in uh, human welfare. And of course, there is still poverty in many parts of the world, but still, um, there are a lot of uh, developments in terms of technology, in terms of uh, industrial output, in terms of agricultural production, poverty reduction and other things. So, if you look at the world GDP, it has been remaining almost static from the zero year of uh, Christian era until at least 1870, after which it moves, you know, like a rocket. It, it is moving straight upwards and it is, uh, you know, reaching uh, uh, more than uh, uh, you know, 50 billion or 60, 60 trillion dollars in in terms of 1990 international dollars. 
So if you look at the real per capita GDP over the last two millennia, we find the same kind of trend. It is again almost like a hockey stick. Uh, you know, it, it was remaining almost static or uh, constant until 1800 uh, or 1850, and then after which it moves upwards. So because of these two, I mean, uh, this, uh, you know, capitalist revolution, there has been a great acceleration in many of the socioeconomic uh, uh, indicators, uh, so which we will, you know, once again project. So if you look at the GDP growth closely, uh, for the last uh, 250 years or so, the 1950, sorry. until 1950. Sir, sorry to interfere, sir. Yeah. The slides are not moving and it is not. Oh. Uh, so, sir, do we have to operate it? If you send it to Dr. Chitra, then we will operate it from here. Okay. Ch it will take some time, no? Yeah, uh, yeah. to take only some. But uh, once more, sir, please try. But if I am not in a slight small slight show mode, it is moving. Is it right? But now nothing is uh, visible to us. Nothing is visible. Yeah. Okay. All sir, if you can read what Gayatri Mohan has written, maybe you know you should share the window. I mean, you should share the screen yeah, rather than sharing uh, screen. Yeah. I I have selected window option. Share window. So, share. Uh -huh. so if you they, if they they say if you can shift to share screen option, it will be better. It will, visibility will be better. Yeah, sir, and then your entire screen. Now, this is, I think. Now, is now, this, now, you are seeing, yes. now you are seeing the great acceleration slide, right? Yes, sir. When I go to the presentation mode, I think it is not working. Okay, okay. Please then see I'm, if, if you, are, you are seeing now. No, we, no. now we are getting only the other mode, not presentation. Oh. This is enough, sir. Huh? This is enough. We will. Sina? I think sometimes it will, some some system will not allow that. Oh, I see. Yeah. Why don't you so, move the slides now? Why don't you try moving the slides, uh, Bolo? I am, moving, sir. I am I am now moving to another slide. From great acceleration, I have now moved to another slide, which is a oh. graph showing the real GDP. Yeah, yeah. but the, we are not getting seeing that uh, slide uh, in the screen now. Oh, I see. If the file size is small, Bolo, uh, is it possible for you to send it email to Dr. Prema? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, now now, now it is moving. Uh, now now it, is it has moved to the one. Yeah. If I go in the regular mode, I mean, uh, you know, in the. Okay. So that is that is that is that is mode. It is working. Okay. Now it is working. Yeah, in uh, whatever mode it is working, you can use that mode, uh, Bolo. Okay. Okay. Then if this is okay. Yeah. It is fine. You okay, can explain. Sir. Okay. Sir. So, uh, my animation center work will not work here. <laughs> that is the problem. Okay. Anyway. Okay. The real GDP has also grown uh, very steeply from the year 1850 or so. So, this, uh, if you, if you, the, the, the capitalist revolution has actually, you know, uh, led to the great acceleration in many of the socioeconomic uh, indicators. So, if you look at the real GDP very closely from the last 250 years or so, it has been increasing very tremendously uh, right from 1950 onwards. Uh, up to 1950, it was remaining almost like a constant, very slow growth. Then, after 1950, there is a steep growth in the real GDP on uh, constant uh, international prices basis. Okay. So, then, if you look at the number of large dams built, then again, there is a steep increase after the year 1950. If you look at the urban population, again, 
after the year 1950 we could see lot of uh, you know tremendous increase in the urban population very steep increase then if you look at the nitrogen fertilizer consumption that has also increased very steeply after 1950 so international tourism again this has also increased very steeply from 1950 onwards so in most of these variables we have seen lot of improvement or tremendous growth uh, only after 1950 so we are comparing the 1950 scenario with 2019 for uh, some of the important economic and uh, demographic variables here so the global population has tripled from 2.5 billion to 7.7 billion over the last 70 years and the global gdp is uh, has increased from 9 billion 9 trillion dollars to 120 trillion dollars a 13 fold increase and per per capita gdp has increased from 3300 to 16000 dollars which is almost a five fold increase more than five fold life expectancy has also increased the phenomenally from 46 years to 73 years and world population in absolute poverty has come down drastically from 60% to 10% but all these improvements or developments came at huge cost huge cost to the environment so let us see the uh, annual carbon dioxide emission which is almost looking like a uh, you know like again a great acceleration after 1950 so we see a steep rise in the annual carbon dioxide emission reaching around more than 35 billion tons in the year 2019 then if you look at the global water withdrawal again you see the great acceleration from 1950 onwards if you look at the primary energy usage again 1950 is the landmark year after which there is a steep increase in the primary energy usage ocean acidification that has also increased tremendously after 1950 so and then biodiversity also has faced a lot of problems and serious crisis after 1950 say for example at present human and livestock population livestock that has that are uh, uh, rare for human purpose uh, they constitute around 96% of mass of all mammals on the planet so only the remaining 4% is accounted for by all the wild animals uh, wild mammals and other things then similarly poultry accounts for 70% of all birds alive at this moment especially the poultry meant for human consumption only the 30% is Uh, 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 all the, uh, uh, the other uh, uh, you know birds so we see the glo- global vertebrate abundance decreasing drastically from 1970 onwards the index has decreased from 100 to 32 so almost 68% decrease in the global vertebrate abundance during the last 50 years so this is again a kind of uh, serious uh, environmental crisis so at present we are living on 1.7 years so the ecologists and uh, you know say that we are uh, over exploiting the biosphere to such an extent that in the year late uh, in the in the late 1960s the ratio of our demand from the biosphere to its regenerative capacity was only 1 now it is 1.7 that means just like you know uh, over exploiting the ground water if 100 million cubic meter of water goes inside the ground if we extract 170 million cubic meter of water then it is called 1.7% Uh, sorry 1.7 times uh, over extraction so it is something similar to happens to the biosphere so we are li- we, we need 1.7 earths but we have only one year so we need 1.7 years to satisfy our current demand on a sustained basis so this is sh- shown in the form of a diagram how this uh, ecological footprint has increased over a period from 1960 to 2017 here we could see that you know the uh, number of earth required for human sustain human life was one almost one earth in 1960 uh, late 1960s which has increased to more than 1.7 in the year 2017 so uh, we here we see there are uh, you know uh, two views okay one uh, i mean sorry uh, there, there is a close correlation between economic uh, development on the one hand and the ecological degradation in the other hand so as the economy develops ecological degradation also has increased so how to reverse this correlation so this is the concern of the world community today as of now so there are two sides to the argument lower pace as compared to the uh, uh, 
population growth. So naturally there will be a famine, pestilence, war and other things which will result in the uh, de massive death of people. Then in secondly, in 1948, two widely read books were published. Uh, one is Our Plundered Planet and the other is The Road to Survival, which inspired a new Malthusian debate on population and the environment. Then in the third one is, the most important thing is uh, the, the contribution made by Paul R. Ehrlich, a Stanford University population biologist who published the book, The Population Bomb. So the book was an instant success and uh, you know Paul Ehrlich, Ehrlich uh, has become very popular among the ecologists and the population biologists. And he argued that the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death at this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the death rate. So that is what he argued. But then it did not happen. Of course, that is a different matter. But the, another major uh, you know, uh, contribution was uh, the Club of Rome commissioned a book titled Limits to Growth, which was uh, authored by four uh, young, uh, young scientists from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, which argued that there are limits to growth, which will be reached within 10, 100 years and the, after that, there will be a sudden and uncontrolled decline in both population and industrial capacity. And then there is another, you know, uh, uh, very famous uh, techno-optimist, economist, or uh, business uh, administration professor, who is Julian Simon, who published his uh, magnum opus called The Ultimate Resource, in which he argued that population is not at all a problem. It is only a success or triumph for humanity because more people means more ideas, new technologies, and better solutions. Then material conditions of life will continue to get better for most of the people in most of the countries indefinitely into the future. So within a century or so, or, or two, all nations and most of the humanity will be at, will be at our about today's Western living standards. So he predicted that you know there will be an all-round improvement in the human well-being in spite of the environmental constraints and other problems. So we need not worry. The ultimate resource is the human brain or human intellect or human ingenuity, which will replace any kind of scarcity in any any type of resource. That is what you know. So it is a kind of you know intellectual audacity which we have to uh, you know. Uh, appreciate for, for, for uh, you know, Julian Simon. Uh, of course, one may not agree with him. That is an altogether different matter. And the later date, uh, you know, the, the present trends in the natural resource exploitation and, uh, you know, biodiversity, uh, sorry, uh, ecological degradation have uh, created a lot of uh, issues which uh, Simon did not uh, foresee. So, uh, before going into my empirical part of my presentation, I will quickly go through some of the drivers of the economy and the economy environment relationship. What are the important uh, driving forces that determine the relationship between the economy and the environment? So, the one is the scale effect, that is, economic growth leads to environmental degradation. More and more economic growth will lead to environmental degradation. That is the scale effect. That is very obvious. If you uh, if your economy grows continuously, then we extract a lot of natural resources, we dump a lot of waste in the atmosphere, in the, in, the, in the environment. So naturally, the environment will degrade. Then there is a composition effect, which is uh, called the uh, shift in the goods balance. So in the pre-industrial society, we were having traditional agriculture. From that, industrialization has resulted in mass production and manufacturing. So because of the move from agriculture to manufacturing, pollution will increase initially. But from manufacturing to services, service industry, so say for example, US economy is called post-industrial society or service economy, where you know, the major portion of the GDP comes from service sector rather than from manufacturing. So because of that, pollution will uh, finally decrease. So this is the composition effect. Then the third is the technology effect, where the technological developments will lead to decrease in pollution uh, or pollution abatement. But this is, again, a problem because technology always, it is a double-edged sword. Sometimes the technology will lead to uh, cleaner production and uh, less pollution. But sometimes the technology will lead to uh, uh, a lot of environmental problems also. So that is there. The, so these three effects, the uh, scale effect, composition effect, and technology effect, they together determine the environment economy relationship. So, this relationship is uh, very uh, uh, comfortably uh, 
described in the form of a inverted u shaped curve which is called the environmental kuznets curve uh, wherein we have uh, we, we see that in the pre industrial economies when they become more getting more and more industrialized the level of environmental degradation initially increase increases and then it reaches a maximum point when the industrial uh, economies reach their peak production or uh, peak then after that the post industrial service sector economy leads to decrease in the environmental uh, degradation which is called the environmental kuznets curve so the problem with environmental kuznets curve is that this is not applicable to all type of environmental damages maybe for certain sectors it may be applicable for certain pollutants it may be applicable initially they may increase and then finally they may decrease but for certain other pollutants it may not be applicable in the sense that the pollutant will pollution will increase continuously without turning downwards then pollution avert abatement measures can raise our demands for the biosphere goods and services that means uh, we are creating pollution and if you want to Uh, uh reduce the pollution then we have to spend lot of energy and resources for pollution abatement activities so that will require lot of resources from the environment that, so that is uh, that is another kind of impact then thirdly prevention might be better might be better than cure so the environmental kuznets curve says that the or uh, the proponents of environmental kuznets curve argue that you pollute initially no uh, never mind about the pollution you grow uh, try to develop the economy after the economy develops to a certain extent uh, or reaches the maximum then naturally afterwards there will be a demand for improved environmental quality because of the improvement in the human livelihood which will and also there will be technologies for pollution abatement so that will finally lead to uh, reduce the uh, you know pollution this is what uh, the uh, ekc or environmental kuznets curve says but many times what will happen is that if you pollute initially up to a certain maximum level and then after that it may be very difficult to clean up the uh, pollution or the polluted environment at a lower cost the cost of clean up at the latter date will be much much more so that is why prevention even in the initial stage itself we have to reduce the pollution or uh, implement policies then there may not be a turning point at all as we already told you know there may be some uh, pollutants for which the, uh, uh, the the pollution will be going on increasing then emission of existing pollutants might to decrease with further economic growth but new pollutants that might substitute for them will increase say for example if you are uh, economy develops and we go for some cleaner production technologies like uh, biofuel but biofuel production requires lot of land so a lot of uh, agricultural or a lot of deforestation will take place if more and more land is diverted from forestry to biofuel production or if we go for uh, go from coal power uh, coal fired power plants to nuclear power we are solving one problem the coal powered uh, coal fired power plants are emitting lot of co2 and sulfur dioxide that problem will be solved but if we move to nuclear power plant there will be another new problem which is the disposal of nuclear waste and the nuclear risk of accident and other things they will happen so that way the environmental kuznets curve does not uh, you know imply you know, uh, you know does not address this kind of issues then another thing is outsource pollution activities to poorer countries some countries may Uh, you know in fact reduce their be the humans so that is the important question because uh, technology is the only solution for uh, that is offered by the neoclassical economists for uh, solving the problems of environmental pollution 